And we are back for Game of Thrones Season 8 Fixed. So the principle of this little game is to take the story and characters, where they were at the beginning of Season 8, and bring them to roughly the same position at the end of Season 8, but in a more satisfying way. Now, this is just what I would have done if I were in the writer's room, and I'm no professional writer. I'm just a dude, a dude who doesn't earn seven figures. Nonetheless, here we go. So, in the actual season, the first episode opens with a throwback to Season 1, Episode 1, with the arrival of Danny being paralleled with the arrival of Robert. And so, I would actually try to maintain this parallel, but I would instead have it more focused on the coming of the others, which is really the issue at hand and how our series began. It certainly wasn't hooray good times. I would have Gendry, Tormund, and Beric in a panic heading south like Will was, and picked up by Umber soldiers. They would be brought before Ned Umber, who asks if they're deserters from the Night's Watch, and Gendry would say deliriously that the wall has fallen. I would then jump to Sansa by the heart tree, as Eddard was in the first episode. But instead of Catelyn coming to him with news of Jon Arryn's death, it's Maester Wolken and news of war. Wolken would say that Queen Daenerys has defeated Randall Tarly's forces in the field, with him being executed. Also, the Unsullied and Dothraki have been raiding the Riverlands for supplies. River Run and the twins have been taken, and her uncle Edmure has been forced to bend the knee. Sansa would ask if there's anything else, and Wolken would say that yes, Jon Snow has bent the knee to Danny and is escorting her north. Additionally, the two have made peace for now with Queen Cersei. Sansa would sit for a moment, and then tilt her head and ask, Did you say Randall Tarly has died? What I'm trying to build here is a Littlefinger-esque Sansa who earns her queenship in the end and uses the scheming that she's learned. We would then have Sam summoned to see Sansa. Sansa would break the news to Sam that his father and brother have been executed by Daenerys. Sam is distraught, and Sansa would feign sympathy and mention that her uncle Edmure is now a captive of Daenerys as well. Sansa would then ask, with the destruction of House Tyrell, who are the most powerful houses in the Reach? Sam would say that House Tarly is rather powerful, as well as House Florent, House Fossway, and House Hightower. Sansa would then point out that House Tarly is Sam's father's house, House Florent his mother's house, and House Fossaway, his sister's house. And then there's House Hightower, famed patrons of the Citadel of Old Town, where Sam served as an acolyte. Sansa would say that it seems that Sam has become one of the most powerful men in Westeros. I would then have John and Danny's arrival, with everyone kneeling as they should, and I would have Bran be the one who's missing rather than Arya. John and Arya would have their reunion, with John asking where she's been, and Arya lying and saying that she fled to Dorne during the war and traveled with a group of performing acrobats. I want to establish that there's some shame and regret with Arya, especially before John. John would look skeptical about the acrobat story, but puts it aside relieved that Arya is safe. He sees that she still has Needle and asks if she's been practicing. Arya says she has and that she's ready to fight. Sansa, rather than being cold, would be artificially courteous to Danny, like Littlefinger would be. Beside her, though, Sansa has brought Sam and Gilly. John would be delighted to see them. John would introduce Danny to his best friend, Sam Tarly, and there would be a moment of awkward knowing between Danny and Sam. Sam Tarly of Horn Hill? Danny would ask, and Sam would stare back and simply say, Yes, my queen. Jorah, oblivious, would tell Danny that this was the man who saved his life at the Citadel. John would then ask where Bran was, and Sans would say that Bran is at the Heart Tree, watching whatever he watches. John would then head to the Heart Tree and have his reunion with Bran. I, by the way, would dial back the whole robot nature of Bran and have him be more emotional. John would say that it's been eons since they were last together here in Winterfell, and Bran would tell him that he actually saw him before. He was at Craster's Keep, and the wolves that rescued him at Queen's Crown Tower that was him. John, shocked, would ask if Bran was a skin changer, and Bran would say that he's more, stronger than that, a green seer, the three-eyed raven. And he's been watching. He saw John at Hardhome, he saw when they stabbed him and when he woke again, and he's seen his past. At this point, Bran would reveal to John that he is the son of Lyanna and Rhaegar, and the heir to the Iron Throne. Before John can properly process the information, though, they're interrupted by Sansa, panicked with news from the last hearth. We would then go to the war room, where it would be explained that the survivors from Eastwatch have arrived at the last hearth. They claim that the wall has fallen, destroyed by an undead dragon. Danny would be devastated. With both John and Danny now distracted with their different issues, Tyrion would then take command of things, initially filling in his Battle of the Blackwater role. He tells everyone that the Bannermen should be called to Winterfell for its defense, as well as the Night's Watch. Assuming the army of the dead is near the last hearth, and mostly on foot, Tyrion estimates that they have a fortnight until the army is upon them. 
he thinks King's Landing should be warned, and wonders aloud if the Lannister army will make it to Winterfell in time. Tyrion would then start talking about how he would use the Unsullied as the primary defense, and he would use the Dothraki to ride behind the Army of the Dead for a hammer and anvil strategy, and then he would be cut off. And this is important. Bran would take command and start giving orders. We need to start establishing Bran as the best leader. Bran proposes a series of walls and trenches to be built on Winterfell's north side. The Army of the Dead will bunch up at each barrier, making them easy targets for trebuchets and dragonfire, and any dead that pass each barrier will be picked off easily from the sides by Dothraki in quick attacks. The Unsullied will guard the trebuchets, but if they fall, everyone will fall back within Winterfell, where the Wildlings, Northerners, and Vale Knights will toss down burning pitch. Someone will then ask what if the walls are breached, and Bran will say that they retreat, make for the ships on the White Knife, and sail south to White Harbor, and then Moat Kaelin. And what about the dragon, the dead one, someone asks? Bran would say that in the past, the only things that have countered dragons are scorpions and other dragons. We have two, and they have one, so perhaps that's an advantage for us. The war room would then break, though I would have Jorah ask to speak to Varys. I wanted to give time to these characters and tie up some loose ends. Lord Varys, Jorah would say. Jorah Mormont, we haven't really had a chance to speak since your return. Have you been avoiding me? They do say that grayscale is highly contagious. Have you spoken with Magister Illyrio? Will he be providing us assistance? Illyrio has stopped speaking with me. His support for the Targaryen cause was based on the hope that Viserys would legalize the slave trade in Westeros, filling his pockets. And with Daenerys, our merchant friend held out some hope of a favorable trading relationship. But now our queen has utterly destroyed slavery. Not just in Slaver's Bay, mind you, but the entire world. There are no Dothraki to bring their spoils to the free cities. And Volantis is on the brink of revolution thanks to red zealots who worship our queen. It's been very bad for business. And why do you still support the Targaryens? Why, Sir Jorah, for the realm, of course. You may fool others, Spider, but Viserys Targaryen was my king for half a year. No man could believe that his rule would be benevolent. I disagree. His grace was a delightfully weak-willed man, easily distracted and easily manipulated. Sadly, you failed in your knightly vows to protect your king. As Hand and Lord Commander, we could have shaped him to be the greatest ruler in history. And Daenerys? You wish to shape her? To be frank, I have little hope. She listens to fewer and fewer these days. Certainly not me. You still have her ear, of which, you may be surprised to hear, I am very thankful. And there is one other. Tyrion. No, no. Not Tyrion. I would then jump to King's Landing with Kyburn telling Cersei that Winterfell reports that the Wall has fallen and that the Army of the Dead marches south. It wouldn't have Cersei smile, but she would have a more calculative look. We would also see the Golden Company arrive with Euron, but I would do a lot more with Euron, tying up loose ends and filling in backstory. Euron would go below deck and we would find Yara, though she would be in a lot worse shape. She asks Euron why he's teaming up with Cersei when the dead march. Euron would say, you think the world ends by ice? No, foolish girl, it ends in fire. I've seen it. What are you talking about, Yara would say. Do you know where I first heard about Daenerys? Karth. I had returned from the Jade Sea and the city was in chaos. Some dragon queen had come through town, but no one really had answers on what happened. The Thirteen were dead, the House of Undying in ruin, and so I sought out the wisest woman in Karth, but she refused to talk. At first, Euron would then produce the Mask of Quaith. Before she died screaming, she had tales to tell about Daenerys Stormborn. Did you know that half the world thinks her Azor Ahai reborn? The delusion of that stupid red cult. I've seen the truth and I'm going to kill her. She's not the world's savior, she's the world's doom. And you wanted to make doom your queen. I wanted to get close to her, to strangle her myself. Plus, who wouldn't want to fuck death herself? And of course, someone needs to rule the world that will rise from the ashes she creates. Euron would then walk over to a table where a dark bottle of wine sits. Have you ever heard of Shade of the Evening? It was the drink of the warlocks of Karth, exclusive to their order, a guarded secret but their charred bones didn't seem to object to me taking a cask from their house. I want you to see what I see. Euron would then force Shade of the Evening down Yara's throat and tell her that he has an engagement to attend. Yara's vision would begin to blur, and then hallucinations would start, with her first seeing Danny's vision at the House of the Undying, with her walking upstairs to the Iron Throne. Then she would see massive destruction, burning people screaming, and finally a wasteland of ash and rubble. She awakens to find that hours have passed, it's now nighttime, and she also finds that she's been tied to the bow of the silence. 
We would next jump to Cersei's war room with Euron, Harry Strickland, and Kyburn. Cersei would tell Kyburn that they will send a raven telling Winterfell that her forces march north. Kyburn would be confused. Will they? As far as Moat Caelan in the neck, but no further. If Daenerys wins, we will need to strike quickly against her before she has time to recover. And if she loses, asks Harry Strickland, the neck is as good of a place to stand as any. The land is nothing but marshes, so the army of the dead should sink unless they choose to bottle up on the King's Road, and we will do our best to make the King's Road impassable. And the Iron Fleet. I want them guarding Daenerys' escape by sea. Guard White Harbor, sink any ship that tries to leave, we will arm your ships with scorpions. Sir Harry, I saw your army disembark. What of my elephants? The Iron Fleet did not have the capacity to transport them on our initial trip. A second trip is needed. This aggravates Cersei. The Iron Fleet is needed for White Harbor. King Euron, you will need to split your forces. Half will guard White Harbor, and half will retrieve my elephants. Kyburn and Strickland would leave, and Euron would express concern over Cersei's plan. Destroying Danny's fleet without her dragons was one thing, he would say, but going ship to dragon seems like suicide. They say I'm mad, but I'm not that mad. Cersei would then proceed to butter up and seduce Euron. She would say that they need to destroy Danny and the Starks completely, utterly. Cersei would then outline her motivation and how it connects to her children. She would say there is too much bad blood, too much history to trust her foes in the north. Sooner or later, they would destroy her. Myrcella was murdered for a crime nearly two decades old. Joffrey for crimes hypothetical. Danny will want justice for Rhaegar's children, the Starks for their parents and siblings. Cersei would say that she had nothing to do with any of them, but her house is still Lannister. Those forces in the north are marching death as much as the army of the dead. She says she needs Euron to protect her, to protect their future child. Our child? Euron would be surprised at the prospect, and Cersei would take him to bed. We would then return to Yara tied to the silence, and Theon would arrive, and we would have a much bigger fight on the deck. Theon would commandeer the silence and mention that Varys' spies were right. Euron and most of his men were ashore. Theon would then raise the silence's sail and escape. His number two would say that ships are following, and Theon would say that it doesn't matter, the silence is the fastest ship in the fleet. Theon would untie Yara, and she would ask where they're going. Winterfell, Theon would say, and Yara would say no, we sail for Volantis. Volantis, Theon would object, I don't want to run, and Yara would say that she is his queen, and they sail for Volantis. I'm building something with the Yara plot. I would then jump back to Winterfell, where Jon and Danny are going for a walk. Danny would say that she still hurts over the loss of Viserion. She's lost so many. Her brother, Drogo, Rhaego, Eerie, Sir Barristan. Who have you lost, she would ask. Jon would think back. It's a long list. My father, my two brothers, Jorah's father, Pip, Gren, Ali, Egret. Egret? Who is she? How do you know she was a she? The way you said it. She was a wildling girl. My first. My only before you. She questioned everything I thought and believed, told me I knew nothing. And she was right more often than not. She taught me that the North, the true North, was a beautiful place. It's people, the free folk. They're honest, giving. It's funny, I missed Winterfell for so long, but down South, there are so many problems. The Northerners are angry I bent the knee. There's Cersei Lannister, the Greyjoys. Everyone is obsessed with titles and fealty. Even my sisters seem to hide things from me. I miss the freedom of the North, the straightforwardness, the simplicity of it all. I understand now why Mance wouldn't kneel. Who? No one. A wildling. Well, sort of. He was kind of half wildling, like me. Danny would then say that there will be simplicity to it all. When she is queen, she can do whatever she wants, and Jon Snow will be her king. Jon would then pause and tell the story of his parentage to Danny. Danny at first would be troubled. But then it would all be clear. This is wonderful, she would say. After my brother died, I thought I was alone. You aren't concerned about me being your nephew. I thought Viserys would be my husband my whole life. These types of marriages don't happen in the North? They do, John would admit, occasionally. Though the wildlings would say it was a mistake. Still, let's keep this between us for now. John and Danny would then be interrupted by Davos, who says that someone was picked up 20 miles from Winterfell. Who is it? The Kingslayer. We would then jump to Jaime, immediately put on trial for his crimes against Ares. And at trial, Jaime would reveal his secret to everyone, that Ares was mad and that he put stashes of wildfire throughout the city. This is actually an important plot point for later in the story. 
Incidentally, I would not have Brienne save Jaime, as it was already established in Season 7 that Brienne told Sansa about Jaime's good side. We can't have Sansa suddenly change her mind about information she already knew. Anyway, I would have Jaime tell the story about how Aerys thought he'd be reborn as a dragon. Jaime would say that yes, he broke his Kingsguard oath, but he kept what seemed to be a greater oath. Perhaps it was his oath to the mother to protect the innocent, but it seemed even greater than that at the time an oath to the living, he reckons, the same oath he came to Winterfell to fulfill. Danny would then question Jaime's motives, wondering if he's one of Cersei's spies. She asks Varys to confirm what Jaime said about her father, as Sir Barristan said nothing of wildfire. Varys would pause and say that Aerys did indeed produce wildfire, as did the Lannisters before the Battle of the Blackwater. It was a common battle tactic for the crown after the death of dragons, though he knew of no plans to destroy the city. Sansa would then interrupt and accuse Jaime of attacking her father, the Hand of the King, in the streets of King's Landing, and the murder of Jory Cassell. Jaime would rebuke this and say that Ned Stark had unjustly ordered the arrest of his brother, putting him on trial in the Eyrie and nearly getting him killed. Sansa would say that this is a lie and that her father would never make such an order. Jaime would say that Lord Peter Baelish was there and that we can ask him. Sansa would then admit that Littlefinger has been executed. I see, Jaime would say. If you rewarded the man who brought you thousands for your fight with death, what hope do I have? I've only brought you one fighter, and a crippled one at that. Perhaps I made a mistake in coming here. Danny would say that there seems to be no one to prove or exonerate Jamie, and Jamie would ask what should be done. Jamie would say that he would demand a trial by combat, but they've been banned. Is there a Council of Septons handy here in the North, he would quip. Danny would then say that there will be a trial by battle. In a fortnight, he will face the army of the dead, on the front lines. She hopes that his one hand serves him well. And that's how I would close episode one. We'll continue on with the story in part two. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.